And I'm going to go ahead and introduce Larry DeGraff. He's our speaker tonight, and we're going to be talking about how the railroad changed placentia. So, Larry? Okay. Well, good evening. Very good to see all of you. And, uh, I'd like to make a slight change in my title. It's really how the railroad changed in Placentia. Because my main theme is the railroad wasn't always a great and glorious institution in Placentia, as some of you may uh, recall. Uh, and I want to take you through its ups and downs, so to speak. The place of uh, railroads in Placentia is a curious one. Through much of its history, the area sought the service of a rail line, and the railroad company played an important role in the city's development. This is basically the way we think of it. But at some times, the railroad didn't want placentia. Sometimes forget the railroad came into this area in the 1880s, and not through placentia until 1910. I wonder why that was. Uh, once the railroad came, it was a key to decades of agricultural growth, but when the citrus industry collapsed, uh, the railroad uh, also somewhat collapsed with it. Then it became a source of major issues and community efforts to resolve them. And some people even wished the railroad would go away. So anyway, let's take an historical journey through the rather curvy path of the railroad in Placentia. It begins in the 1870s when railroads first came to Southern California. The Southern Pacific built a line from the north into Los Angeles, and by 1874 had extended it to Anaheim, and soon after to Santa Ana. But a long feud with the Irvine Company over running tracks over its land stopped development for several years. By the mid-1880s, the Southern Pacific had a rival line, the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe, usually abbreviated to the Santa Fe which built into Southern California from the east and reached Los Angeles in 1885. The result was fierce competition uh, between these two companies for travelers, and that led to the famous land boom of the 1880s, during which each railroad cut its rates to the extent that one could travel from Chicago to Los Angeles for $25. Uh, let's try doing that today. Uh, anyway, this brought several thousand people to Southern California and created not only a housing boom, but a market for real estate, created towns, uh, buildings, short spur lines, and independent railroads to move the people and materials. The area that would soon become Orange County was part of this boom as railroads were built to it from two directions. The Santa Fe built a line from Los Angeles east uh, to a newly created town called Fullerton arriving there in 1888. Earlier, an independent company called the Riverside, Santa Ana, and Los Angeles Railroad constructed a line from Riverside through the Santa Ana Canyon, which was quite a feat, um, uh, to a depot named Richfield, which today we know as Atwood. The next obvious move would seem to have been a line to join uh, these two. And here you have your map. Here is uh, the line uh, of the uh, Southern Pacific, and here's the line of the Santa Fe. But this line didn't exist. Instead, each railroad went up to a certain point, in one case in Fullerton, in the other case in Atwood, and went south to Orange, leaving this whole area in 1887 completely undeveloped as far as transportation was concerned. Uh, and leaving uh, the growing number of citrus growers in Placentia with no choice but to put their fruit in wagons and haul it all the way to the nearest uh, packing station, which in that packing house was in Fullerton, if they wanted to get them to outside markets. That's an interesting question. Why did the railroads build this way? South to Orange in each case, and leave Placentia completely out. OK, uh, there were several reasons. One, the initial railroad was built by two different companies, each with its own ideas of where it wanted to go. Um, now, the small line was still soon acquired by the Santa Fe, but the main goal of the Santa Fe was to build a line from Los Angeles to San Diego, not to go through Placentia. So uh, where the way its line went, 
south was very understandable. Then remember, Placentia was just beginning to have citrus groves and for that matter, much in the way of population. It was really a pretty bleak area and it didn't uh, encourage uh, uh, the idea that it would be a developing market or a smart place to build a railroad. In fact, its most widely planted crop in the late 1880s was barley. You don't really need a railroad uh, to haul barley and nor is that a very efficient way to haul it. So uh, we have uh, several reasons why Placentia was sort of uh, left in the, uh, in the lurch. Placentia's residents asked the Santa Fe for a line through the area several times, but the company rejected these pleas for quite a few years. First of all, it already had uh, depots in Fullerton and in Richfield, as it was called then, um, and it seemed, seemed like Placentia was too close to either of them to be a very sensible place uh, to build a depot. In Placentia's, uh, then uh, another factor was that residents wanted a station. There's a significant difference between a station and a depot. A depot is just a place you dropped uh, goods. A station had full services to sell passengers tickets and so forth. Santa Fe offered Placentia a depot and Placentia residents said, nuts, we want a station. Well, until 1910, they didn't get a station. Um, then there was the uh, problem of uh, two small companies that offered to build lines north and south through Placentia, but neither of them materialized. So, uh, uh, and finally, the Pacific Electric, which at that time, we sometimes forget, carried freight as well as passengers, entered Orange County from Whittier by 1910, but instead of going to Placentia, it went north and east to Yorba, present day Yorba Linda, uh, and so Placentia was still left with no rail line. Finally, in 1909, Sam Kramer sold six acres to the Santa Fe to construct a line from Richfield to Fullerton. He and four others raised money for the right of way in a depot, and in 19, June 1910, the line was finally completed. To get a sense of what this meant uh, to people in Placentia, recall the uh, experience of one minister who says his family, he and his family left the breakfast table and stood at their window with tear-filled eyes at the sight of a train uh, coming through the Placentia area. The Placentia cutoff is what this line was called and it reduced the distance from Richfield to Fullerton by eight miles, quickly led the Santa Fe to set up daily freight trips and very soon after led to the construction of several packing houses. Uh, so, uh, Placentia was finally on the map as far as having railroads. Placentia soon realized several benefits from the railroad. And as in the case of some other new towns, the arrival of the railroad service coincided with planning and developing a town. It was after all in 1910 that A.S. Bradford and others laid out the town of Placentia. It was just an empty barley field before then. In Placentia's case, Santa Fe officials took an interestingly personal interest in the emergence of the physical town. Partly, I think, since the completion of the Pacific Electric that same year, Yorba had created a competitor for citrus <coughs> shipments. At any rate, one Santa Fe official by the name of J.S. Hancock personally encouraged uh, buyers to uh, patronize Placentia fruit and made sure that the rail service was as efficient as possible. So much so that some people began to refer to Placentia as, quote, Hancock's pet, unquote. Now, Santa Fe's favoritism also stemmed from Placentia's continuing status, and this was rather unique, as a one railroad town. Remember, there are by now three railroads on the scene, the Santa Fe, the Southern Pacific, and the Pacific Electric. Only one went through Placentia. Uh, that meant when you started adding up your statistics and looked at the Santa Fe uh, shipments, wow. Placentia shipped more crops on the Santa Fe line in Southern California than any other city besides Los Angeles. Now, of course, if you add to other cities what they shipped on the Pacific Electric and uh, uh, Southern Pacific and smaller lines, it's not so staggering, but uh, that proved to be a, uh, an interesting benefit for Placentia. Okay, uh, Placentia's railroad system was completed in 1911 when the station was built. 
One thing I'd like to clarify, the city of Placentia did not build the station. The Santa Fe funded and built uh, the station uh, and therefore owned it and ran it. Um, this would come back to haunt the city of Placentia when they decided to demolish the station. Uh, anyway, um, the station, oh, I should go to the next line, and here is the station. Typical shape, sort of an airplane uh, model, as they call it at that time, of architecture, uh, very similar to um, uh, what you now have in Fullerton, what they had at that time, and quite a few other areas. Incidentally, Fullerton is just about our last chance to see a station of this architectural style. Virtually all of the others have been torn down. Okay, by this time, 1911, the Santa Fe had increased its round-trip passenger service from Los Angeles to San Bernardino to four trips a day. Some ran through Placentia, some still took that uh, Y uh, down to Orange and back up. Passenger service uh, uh, received competition from the Pacific Electric, which set up stations in La Habra, Brea, which then called Randolph, and Yorba. In each of these cases, those towns sprang up when the railroad went through. PE was also the third largest freight carrier in California. It's interesting to imagine what would have occurred if there had been lively, long-term competition between the two. Uh, by 1920, the PE was also a third largest freight carrier. It didn't just carry passengers. But planned extensions of its route in northern Orange County were either dropped by the company or blocked by the federal government during World War I, and by the late 1920s, the PE began to lose passengers. It abandoned a lot of tracks, particularly after World War II, and the line to Yorba was closed. So Placentia never had a great deal of use from the Pacific Electric. The tra a track had been built early in the uh, whole uh, situation, north from Richfield, and extended into Olinda, if you don't have the map here, uh, to serve the oil industry. But it has a rather interesting claim to fame. It was the site of the worst train wreck in the history of this area. Uh, nice uh, thing to remember it by. Uh, it happened in August uh, 1915 when an oil car uh, got detached from the train uh, and um, rolled down the steep hill from the London down. And the result was, first of all, what you see here, uh, the train, the engine locomotive uh, uh, colliding uh, with a Pacific, with a Santa Fe railroad uh, a train, and then the whole thing bursting into flames when the oil car uh, exploded. So there's that. And this is the uh, burnt remnants of the locomotive. The uh, passenger cars were made of wood, and they all completely burned up. I don't know how to explain this, but the only dead were three crew members. Uh, however, all 30 passengers uh, went to the hospital. Uh, uh, Placentia area couldn't match that until 2002. Uh, then in 2002, uh, a um, uh, car coming from uh, a freight train coming from the east completely missed its stoplight. And at Jefferson Avenue, smashed into a parked uh, Metrolink. Uh, uh, yeah. And the result, miraculously, was uh, two people were killed on the spot and three more died shortly thereafter. How more escaped uh, death, I'm not sure. But anyway, a total of 160 were hurt, and 166 of those went to the hospital. Uh, so that was, uh, in some statistical ways, the worst crash in history. Anyway, that's the gloomy side of the railroad of Placentia. I wanted to get out of the way, and then we come back to some brighter aspects. Okay, through the interwar years, the main function of the Santa Fe in Placentia was definitely the shipment of freight and no kind at all came close to citrus in volume. Placentia mirrored the county where the acreage planted and the number of citrus trees uh, increased uh, rather steadily. Oh, here's a bigger picture of the crash. That is close up. There's the locomotive and there's the apparently the... That's in Olinda. Uh, is it in Olinda or you know location of the crash? Uh, it was on Jefferson Avenue just oh, where? No, this one. Oh, this, this, is, this is the one that was on... Oh, pardon me, no, this one? Yeah, at, um, wherever the, the old train line is gone, it was somewhat, well, north up to Olinda, it, 
are wide off from the Santa Fe, so it's probably somewhere around where we have uh, the center of Atwood today. Yeah. This one? Yeah, mm -hmm. 1950. Oh, so it's at the yeah. yeah, yes, it rolled all the way down the hill oh. from Linda, hit the main Santa Fe track, oh, hit a train right on the main Santa Fe track. Yeah. Uh, another uh, interesting aspect of that, there was another switch that could have been pulled to take it off the line before it got to the Santa Fe track. Uh, the crew was so amazed to see this, uh, the switch crew, see this thing rolling down the hill. They didn't even get around to throwing a switch, and so it went all the way through another switch right into the uh, passenger train on the main Santa Fe track. Okay, as I say, through the interwar years, the main function of the Santa Fe was shipping freight, particularly citrus. And what we have is, um, oh, here's, here's a later, I forgot I had this one. Okay, this is your 2002 uh, crash. Uh, there's the freight train, and here's your Metrolink. And what we don't see is cars derailed. Uh, obviously, it wasn't quite such a uh, horrendous impact as the 1915 one had, but still in, in a sense. Okay, here is your figures on citrus. Now, what's very obvious is the citrus industry down to, uh, through 1950 or to 1950, uh, grew rather steadily, uh, unevenly at some times, both in terms of acres and trees. Uh, particularly interesting uh, is the big increase in boxes of fruit shipped between 1925 and 1930, an increase I can only uh, suggest was due to the fact that a great many trees had matured uh, and, there, and therefore more fruit was going to uh, market. But it was a steady increase uh, until the Great Depression. Then you'll notice between 1930 and 1940, a very little increase in boxes shipped uh, and or, for that matter, in acreage or in trees planted. Then in 1945, that was pretty much the peak of the citrus industry, almost 21,000, uh, 21 million, pardon me, boxes uh, shipped, uh, and um, also uh, a um, peak year for um, citrus acreage and uh, trees. From there on, there was a mild decline uh, until 1950, and then as you see, the decline in boxes is very uh, precipitous although the strange slight increase in boxes between 55 and 60, I can only explain uh, by the idea that it's still in 55, you had some young trees that hadn't born yet. Uh, by 1960, all of these were mature. But this, this gives you a sense of how many um, boxes were being shipped. Uh, at times, eight trains, full uh, cargo trains per day left uh, 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 placentia from the various packing houses uh, to market the fruit. This boom lasted until the early 1950s when placentia packing houses sent out in 1953 4,200 cars of oranges. You can imagine that, real cars of oranges. That was the, hey, that was the top year of all, 1953. By this time, the Santa Fe had developed a refrigerator department, which arranged for empty refrigerator cars to be spotted at various packing houses where they were loaded, then taken to assembly points to be iced and assembled into groups of cars designed for specific markets. It was a very elaborate organization. Uh, and it continued to play a major role in Placentia's citrus economy well into the post-World War II period. Passenger service was somewhat different. That began to decline during the 1920s and 30s, although it remained an important part of the railroad's role in Placentia. The number of trains daily dropped to two or three, but the quality and speed of service increased. Gas electric engines replaced steam engines starting in the 1930s. They were more efficient, but most of what we might remember about them, they were slicker in appearance. Oh, pardon me, I know that's one of my biggest things here. Yeah. Here's my favorite example of how the railroad fit in. Notice, first of all, here's your main track uh, running through, but on either side of the track in various places are these spur lines 
two different citrus houses. There is, I don't know the one at the very top, that is a Bradford house. There is your station, um, not, Brad, not Bradford house, the Bradford packing house. This I don't recognize. This is the recently demolished POGA, and this is the still existing PMOA packing house. So here's, here's your main. Now there are, I don't know what that was, whether that was a packing house or that was or not. Here, incidentally, are your old water towers. Uh, here, of course, is a still existing Kramer building, and here's Santa Fe. So, uh, obviously, obviously crucial uh, was uh, uh, the railroad going through the middle. One other thing you might notice, this is an intersection. What's the traffic look like on it? The <laughs> Bradford. <laughs> Bradford, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, that's something I'll get back to uh, later on in the talk. And here are typical freight trains either laying, put, waiting, being loaded, or in this case, going through on the main line. Where was the station? The station? Yeah, right there in the corner. Yeah. 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 Charlie Carey's Market was the point of Yeah, that's it. Oh. Mm -hmm. The Kramer building. Yeah, that's the Kramer building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Charlie Carey had his market in the ah. corner. Yeah, this, this picture, of course, is in our library right at the entrance to the history room. To me, it's a, it's a beautiful way of seeing uh, the way the whole uh, city functioned. Okay, on to the next one. Okay, here is a typical passenger train. Notice it has a grand total of three passenger cars. Passenger service was not enormous uh, through northern Orange County. Uh, you can't see quite the streamlined uh, look, but that's uh, one of these uh, gas electric uh, uh, engines. Is that San Ana Canyon? Yes, it's going into San Ana Canyon. Yeah. Here is your more uh, romantic look, perhaps, but uh, these, this is the Mail and Express, one of two uh, named uh, trains uh, that the Santa Fe Railroad sent through uh, North Orange County, and some of them took the Y down to Orange. This one happened to be uh, photographed in Atwood, going 79 miles an hour. Wow. <laughs> uh, so these were not only sleek in appearance, but they could be pretty sleek in uh, motion as well. <laughs> yes, uh, which became a problem later on. Um, they also had the benefit over steam engines, which take a while to start up and, uh, and once you stop them, that they could stop at any little crossroads, pick up mail and so forth, uh, so they are offered a more efficient service uh, in that way. And finally, they were given fancy names. Some of you probably can recall the chief and the super chief. Well, this were local versions of those named uh, trains. Okay. Um, Photo, the 1950s and 60s were also an era when railroads bought up land in cities like Fullerton and Anaheim for industrial plants. Now, they didn't make many such acquisitions in Placentia, but the city paved the way for future industries by nagging, uh, they call it negotiating, from reading experiences, I think nagging might be a better way, with the Santa Fe until they finally agreed to build a spur uh, from uh, Fullerton underneath the freeway, as you now know it, into the then completely vacant industrial area of Santa Fe. And there were some titterings. That's a road to nowhere. Uh, but of course, since then, uh, that has been a very significant part of our railroad system as far as industrial development is concerned. Okay, now this whole system of citrus marketing and passenger service based on the Santa Fe Railroad came apart in the years after 1950. First to decline sharply was passenger service. The Pacific Electric virtually disappeared in the 1950s. Other lines were abandoned or realigned as passenger service fell. And this continued more severely through the 1960s, culminating in 1969 when the Santa Fe ordered all passenger service in Placentia stopped. You could no longer take the train to or from Placentia. Two years later, it went one step further. All rail service 
to Placentia. It was over. Freight, passengers, everything. Uh, later that year, we brought bulldozers in, and that was the end of the station. So very abruptly, uh, Placentia went from full service to only freight service to no service. And it stayed that way uh, for quite a few years. Now, and incidentally, two other things happened in its wake. What had been happening for a couple of decades before that is that the orange groves themselves were being bulldozed and replaced by housing tracts. And um, so uh, this whole decline of rail service really mirrored the decline of the entire citrus economy to the point that uh, by the early 1980s, we had, as far as I can recall, no citrus trees left outside the Key Ranch in Placentia. Now that's a pretty big drop from 20 million citrus trees to one little grove in the Key Ranch. They weren't making enough money off the oranges. No, and they were paying higher taxes. Yeah, well, there are a lot of reasons why the citrus economy uh, collapsed as it did. And of course, uh, during that collapse, uh, there was also a change in uh, passenger services. Um, in 1971, throughout the nation, most privately run uh, passenger trains were re uh, consolidated into the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, which we know as Amtrak. Uh, and 20 years later, a similar thing happened uh, with local transportation. The PE was pretty much gone by then, and so uh, Metrolink was set up uh, to essentially try to carry the same interurban service that the PE once had. But by that time, of course, a vast majority of people who wanted to go one place to another had found a phenomenon known as the freeway, uh, and the need for uh, passenger trains has never uh, been that great uh, since. But one part of railroad services did not decline in the 1950s and after, and that was the continued use of the main tracks for long-haul traffic uh, between Southern California ports and interior parts of the country, quite the opposite. Uh, this traffic increased several fold as economic globalization increased trade among nations, uh, especially those in the Pacific Rim. A central route for this traffic, as you saw on that map, uh, was the Santa Fe line through what was now being called the Orange Thorpe Corridor, sometimes the Gateway, uh, uh, which ran straight through Placentia. Now, trains not only ran more frequently, they were longer. 100 car trains are not a particularly curious thing uh, anymore. Fine, except that as, as the rail traffic increased, so did the population and so did their vehicles. The result was a conundrum in which um, uh, at times uh, you had delays of uh, streets crossing uh, railroad tracks of at least 10 minutes to wait for the train to go and sometimes even worse than that, the frustrating phenomenon that one train came right after another. And here is a perhaps rather benign example of these uh, traffic pileups that you had uh, when the, the train was coming through. One resident uh, summed it up very nicely when she told a reporter in 2000 the situation was, quote, a really, really big hassle. They trap you and you can never turn around. It drives everybody crazy. From Lakeview Avenue in the east to Placentia Avenue in the west, Placentia came to see railroads that had been a pillar of prosperity becoming a persistent problem without any visible benefits to the city. Now, to add uh, to that problem, increasing rail traffic raised concerns on the rail company about accidentally colliding with cars or pedestrians on the tracks. The answer to that, horns. And so orders went out to uh, conductors going through populated areas, sound your horn before coming to any intersection. Well, most of you look like you can recall uh, what that situation was like. Um, and finally, uh, after several years of complaints to the railroads and local governments, uh, led to establishing a quiet zone in the Placentia area that included gates and barriers to prevent incursions on the tracks in return for ending most of the horn blowing. Incidentally, I had a feeling that I first had the mistaken view that, well, this must have happened all over. I noticed a newspaper article just the other day that um, 
some place in Riverside County has just set up a quiet zone. So for centuries, perhaps in the vanguard of uh, reducing railroad noise in that area. But traffic congestion was probably the worst problem. And that became such a widespread problem that by the end of the century, uh, an agency was set up to work out a solution. I'm fascinated by its official name. The Orange North American Trade Rail Access Corridor Authority. Mercifully, somebody shortened it to OnTrack, which we know it as. Anyway, um, it was initially planned to be a multi-city program with Anaheim, Fullerton, Yorba Linda joining Placentia. Uh, that city, uh, its officials, asked to spearhead its plan, and its director of public works, Chris Becker, uh, was named to head it. The initial plan, fascinatingly, was to build overpasses at every major intersection. But that posed a problem, uh, the planners noticed. The, inter the uh, overpass could go all the way into the city to the point it might even run into some buildings like City Hall. So uh, they th gave it a second thought and said, no, why don't we instead build a great big ditch about five miles long between somewhere <coughs> around Kellogg all the way down to Placentia Avenue. So that was the program that they uh, went on. Um, it would be about five, minute, five miles long, about 30 to 40 feet high, and three tracks wide. Pretty big trench. Now, at first there were thoughts that this wasn't going to cost anybody locally very much. And the Orange County Transportation Authority, OCTA, approved over $30 million on the project with the anticipation that, hey, this isn't stopping any place in Orange County. Therefore, it isn't really helping Orange County any. Let the feds pay for the whole thing, or the state at least, pay for the whole thing. They're the ones that are benefiting. Well, that thinking lasted only a few years. And then the federal and state funds uh, ran out, and the county looked around and said, now who is going to share the uh, cost of finishing this? Well, trouble was that Anaheim, Yorba Linda, and Fullerton never formally signed up to the program. Placentia was leading uh, a line that didn't exist. So this city wound up uh, with a tab for a while for all of a local share of the construction. And of course, as you know, we're still feeling uh, that uh, fact. Eventually, the OCTA assumed control of the project, ditched the idea of an underground corridor, and built underpasses or overpasses at each major cross street, I think with the exception of Raymond. I took a look at them today, and Raymond seems to have been the one place that actually lowered uh, the tracks a bit. With these completions, uh, the era of the railroad as a problem to Placentia may be coming to an end. Okay, but could the railroads regain a past image as a center of economic activity and city growth? This possibility arose in the early years after 2000 when city officials began soliciting Metrolink for a train station. That system had 12 stations along a 91 freeway from Union Station to downtown Riverside, and one source said it also had 12 stations in Orange County making Placentia, fascinatingly, whichever way you looked at it, station number 13. Um, Placentia station would be good also for spurring the development of long-needed parking facilities in the downtown area. So in May 2007, the City Council and Planning Commission contracted for an environmental impact report and made arrangements for funding its share, about $5.4 million, of a $35 to $38 million estimated uh, project. City officials were enthusiastic about the projects uh, for several reasons. First, it would be closer to Cal State Fullerton than Fullerton Station itself was, and therefore the prospect that uh, uh, quite a few students would take the uh, train. Uh, then officials also predicted it could, quote, kickstart housing and commercial development in the downtown area, unquote, which is still very much a hope. Some wondered if in light of other economic problems in the early 2000s, the city could come up with its share of funding. But very recently, the County Board of Supervisors seemed to brush aside those qualms when it approved a final cooperative agreement uh, just last month. The City Council will vote on approving this agreement on July 12th. Construction is estimated to begin in 2018. In short, perhaps a new version of a choo-choo may be stopping at the for human travelers 
rather than orange boxes, but nonetheless providing a daily service that had long marked the century's place in the region. Thank you. Oh, I have one more little picture, I think. Yes, to see what the. Uh, this strikes me as an interesting example of uh, how Proximus Railroad has uh, come uh, to us in uh, Placentia. Okay, any questions or comments to make? Okay, well, thank you very much. And I'll turn the uh, whole thing back to uh, Wendy. Or is Wendy here? Old train Depot. Wasn't there somebody living in the old train depot? I'm not sure. Uh, there was a family living there. But it was demolished quite quickly after. No, but I'm talking about the old train depot. Oh, the depot. <laughs> the old train depot. Because there, there was some people living, some hmm. family living there. Could be. I'm not, uh, I don't remember the name now. Hmm. Sure. Any other? Well, I know on Esperanza Road, um, I was told that the trains would stop there, I don't know, maybe in the 40s, and pick up some of the Norbas. <laughs> Got on the train. So they had to put something out there to let the trains stop. Well, they'll say once they switched from steam to gas electric, it became a lot easier for the trains to make uh, uh, short stops. So the service was quite a bit more efficient. Yes? Is there any other kind of history, like, you know, uh, that maybe the train got robbed? (laughs) (laughs) That's an interesting one. I haven't run across that. Uh, I'm just wondering, too. Well, you know, the land out there, I know my grandma's land, the city, or they came out and put meters on the wells. Oh. And that's... <laughs> to keep from... They weren't made enough off the oranges to pay mm-hmm. for the taxes and for the water and all that stuff. Yeah. What about the original safe that was on the corner of Melrose and Crowther down there? When they demolished the building, they left the safe there for a couple of <laughs> Oh, dear. It was, like, probably built in 1880. Hmm. I haven't heard about that one either. Any other questions or comments? Well, I know there used to be a lot of, uh, on Jefferson and Orenstorff, there used to be a lot of accidents at that crossing. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of cattle got on the, some of those tracks out there, and they got hit by the train. Oh, yeah. Now, I know some places, I forget which one now I saw this uh, just recently, are building uh, roped fences uh, on either side. I think it's down in South Orange County to keep animals. Uh, I know, it's stray dogs around some of the Orange County beaches that are concerned that they wander onto the tracks and are building fences to keep the dogs off. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, if not, thank you very much, Ken.